Hey everybody, um, this is me, Mr. B. I'm back for another virtual class. And today we're going to talk about Ernest Hemingway, but uh, before that I do have a couple of announcements to make. Um, when we started the semester, uh, we were going to have a total of five essays. The final exam being the final essay, which is going to be a research-based paper. Um, literary analysis. Uh, however, due to what were surely unforeseen circumstances at the start of the semester, um, we are now only going to have four essays. Okay, so the fourth essay that I put up on D2L a few days ago is your final essay. Um, I would advise you to get working on it uh, as soon as you can. If you want to get drafts to me, I've got some, all the information you need is on D2L. So you need to check D2L for uh, SA4. Um, it is going to be research optional. Again, just it's going to have the same requirements as the first three essays. Uh, I had to make adjustments that I felt were fair. Um, I know people have different situations, different technology availability and access. So if you want to do research for it, you can. If you want to use outside sources, you can, but it's optional. You, you do not have to. Um, so check D2L for the requirements for uh, essay four, which, as I said just a second ago, is going to be the final essay. So you have uh, everything's on D2L. Just, just make sure you check there. So now that that's over, I um, hope everybody is doing as well as can be, uh, staying safe, you know, with all, all of this. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it because everybody's got their own opinions. And today in this video, we're going to talk about Ernest Hemingway and my opinions on, on him as a writer. So uh, as per normal, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the author himself before we talk about the story, which is Hill's like white elephants, um, which is a very, very short story. Uh, so, first of all, uh, Ernest Hemingway was born um, July 21st of 1899 in Oak Park, Illinois. Um, he died on July 2nd, 1961, so he was just shy of his 62nd birthday. <clears throat> he uh, took his own life. He died by suicide um, using his quote-unquote favorite shotgun, so kind of a sad ending to a, what can only be described as, a, 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 in, in my opinion, as an incredibly interesting and accomplished life. Um, he started as with many of our writers you know he started rather young but he actually became a professional writer at a very young age um when he was 17 years old uh, after like like some of the other authors we've talked about uh he had certain teachers or a teacher while he was in high school that noticed the that he had quite a gift for for as a writer so he recommended him uh, for a job and he got his first professional writing job at the Kansas City Star at, at, as I said at the age of 17 um, now some of you are pretty close to that age right now so uh, you can imagine that that would be a pretty big deal um, for anyone much less a, you know a young 17 year old covering the crime beat for a, a pretty big newspaper for a pretty big city. Um, now, this first job, professional job, at the KC Star uh, would be incredibly influential on his life as a writer. Um, one of the editors at the newspaper basically, I, I don't want to go so far as to say required, but highly suggested that you as a as a reporter there that that you follow their guidelines and they basically said 
keep it simple, stupid. And if you look at Hemingway's body of work, um, his prose style is <coughs> comparatively uh, quite simple. And now when I say simple, I don't mean um, that he's not saying much. I'm saying structurally. You know, he's not using a lot of compound sentences, not a lot of compound complex sentences. He's not going into the these crazy prose styles, you know, like stream of consciousness and stuff. He, he, his sentences are very straightforward. Um, I personally call it economy of words, you know, whereas one writer, and I'll show you some comparisons in a, in a minute here, but uh, whereas one writer may spend 20 plus words in a single sentence to say something that could arguably be stated just as well, if not better and more clearly, in eight or nine words. And that's kind of the style that Hemingway um, lived by. You know, he uh, I've got a quote here that I'm going to read you. And this is from when he worked at the, at the Kansas City Star as a, as a very young man. Um, so his quote is, this is from uh, some, uh, an interview about where somebody was asking, some, uh, you know, well, where, where did your style come from? How did you develop this, this kind of very straightforward and simple style? And his response is, quote, On the star you were forced to learn to write a simple declarative sentence. This is useful to anyone. Newspaper wor work will not harm a young writer and could help him if he gets out of it in time. So again, his answer is very straightforward in using simple sentences. Um, now, to show a comparison of what I'm talking about, um, one of his contemporaries, he was actually a, a personal friend of his that will go into this background soon, was James Joyce. And James Joyce is, at least in my opinion, uh, the most complex writer as far as just prose style goes uh, that I've ever, uh, I think ever in, in the English language. Um, he's without question the most complex that I've ever read. Um, if you guys doubt me, you know, break out, like I said when we were talking about Faulkner, break out Finnegan's Wake or uh, Ulysses. But I'm going to do a direct comparison. Now, when I'm doing these comparisons, you know that just as when you're doing your essays and you pick your quotes and your sources, you're cherry picking. You're, you're picking specific examples that exemplify the point you're trying to make. So I picked a couple, one from Hemingway and one from Joyce, that I think illustrate this, uh, this divergence of styles, you know, this, this vast difference. So this is the first line that I'm, what I'm about to read is the first line from A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Now, it goes, quote, Once upon a time and a very good time, it was... There, <laughs> I gotta start over. He, he doesn't use a lot of punctuation, so let me start this over. Once upon a time and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming down along the road, and this moo cow that was coming down along the road met a nice little boy named Baby Tucku. And then it's followed by an ellipsis, and it goes into a whole lot of other stuff. So that's just the first line from A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which to me is one of uh, Joyce's more straightforward works. Um, in contrast, uh, this is the opening line from Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, which is his first novel, and for me personally, my favorite. Uh, I, I don't like to say like his best, because that's, it's my favorite. The Sun Also Rises <clears throat> is my favorite novel by Hemingway. So here's the opening line of this. Robert Cohn was once middleweight boxing champion of Princeton. It really doesn't get much simpler than that. It's matter of fact. It's direct. Uh, it's a declarative, as he said in the quote up above. It's a, it's a about as declarative of a sentence as you can get. So that illustrates just the difference between um, his style and many other of his contemporaries. Um, 
Now, as he was working, uh, while he was working as a reporter, uh, World War I broke out, and the United States, uh, mo uh, well, a lot of people don't, don't realize this, but the United States actually got involved in World War I very late into the war. The war officially started, I believe, in 1914, <clears throat> and the U.S. didn't get officially involved, uh, where, by that I mean a declaration of war, uh, until 1917. And uh, Hemingway basically volunteered. He was rejected from, from the army based on uh, his eyesight. And one of the staples of Hemingway is that he was a very rugged, very rough, I guess you could say like a man's man, you know, so he wanted in. He wanted, uh, he was also very, you know, very patriotic and whatnot. Uh, and he wanted to be involved, and he couldn't. The the military said no. The U the U S military didn't wouldn't allow him due to his eyesight. So he basically went over to. He joined the war, uh, working as an ambulance driver for the Red Cross. So he was involved directly in the war, and he was in Italy, uh, basically in in the mix in, in, uh, on the front lines in, in the uh, Italian campaign and he was hit by a mortar shell and it injured him uh, quite severely, almost fatally. He, he spent many, many months in the hospital and it was there while he was uh, recovering from this wounds um, that he met who would eventually become his first of four wives. Uh, so yeah, he enjoyed the company of women, uh, perhaps, depending on <laughs> whose perspective you're asking, a little bit too much. Uh, however, he, after the war and he had recovered from his injuries, um, he ended up spending uh, a lot of time in Paris. And when he was in Paris, he was actually working as a foreign correspondent for the uh, I believe it was the Toronto Star. So he was working for a Canadian newspaper at this point, the Toronto Star, but he was living in Paris as an expatriate. And it was there that he met through his work as a, as a journalist and, and uh, an expatriate, which basically just means someone, if in the general sense, it's someone who's uh, working professionally or living professionally in a country that is not their country of origin. Um, so it's not an immigrant. It's you're not you're you're not officially immigrated to that country. You're living there as a, a basically as, as a professional for for your job. And it was there that he started hanging out with people of like minds. You know, artists, uh, writers, poets, all all kinds of group of people. And he had he joined a group. Um, of people that are now extremely famous, but at the time they had diff various varying levels of fame. Um, one of the main uh, women or persons in the group was Gertrude Stein, and she introduced jo uh, Joyce. She introduced Hemingway to part of her group that she called the Lost Generation. And we'll talk about that name in just a second. But among that group, um, and these they, they would hang out at cafes, drink, drink alcohol was very important. They did a lot of drinking. Uh, but it was Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, who many of you should know, uh, probably had to read The Great Gatsby in high school. Uh, so F. Uh, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ezra Pound, uh, James Joyce, and Pablo Picasso. So they were kind of a group that, that Stein had dubbed the Lost Generation. And that term, uh, Lost Generation, is often associated with World War I. Because in Europe, particularly mainland Europe, um, and you know Great Britain to, a, to, to an extent too, but in mainland Europe, the death toll from World War I was devastating. I mean, it was... It's almost 
impossible to fathom. I mean, you can look at the numbers and read the numbers on a piece of paper or on a computer screen, but it's not going to do justice to what it actually was. I mean, for young men, particularly aged around 18 to 24, 25, hundreds of thousands were lost in roughly about four to six years. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions. I mean, it's it's the real numbers of, of the losses in World War I, we'll never know. We will never know. Um, but it's, it's unfathomable. Um, so Stein came up with this name for their group, the, the Lost Generation, because they were all tied to World War I in one way or another, and they were all survivors. Um, it was during this time uh, that while working as a reporter and in Europe uh, while he was taking he would go about he wouldn't he didn't just stay in Paris and one of the trips that he took while he was over there uh, was to Spain and while he was in Spain he was introduced to bullfighting and he immediately just fell in love with bullfighting you know like I said Hemingway was a very, very avid outdoorsman. He was rugged, he was rough, he was tough, and he thought that there was no more manly thing in the world uh, that, than bullfighting. He, he just, you know, he went to the running of the bulls in Pamplona, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, if not, just, if you really care to see it, just w you watch YouTube of the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. Uh, he attended that twice. Uh, he was really big into bullfighting. And it was these experiences, combined with other uh, other life experiences, that got uh, inspired him heavily in his first novel, The Sun Also Rises. And with a lot of his writing, and many other writers, you know, I keep saying to y'all, write what you know. Um, for me, when I when I I know I've read The Sun Also Rises, you know, I wouldn't say many times, but I've read it at least three or four times. And <clears throat> once I learned a little bit more about Hemingway and his life, um, to me, the main character is, is a man named Jake Barnes, and Jake Barnes is a very, very thinly veiled uh, representation of Hemingway himself. You know, he's he, he was a fighter, a boxer, uh, he was a rough guy, rugged guy, he was a World War I veteran, he was working as a, a, at, at a foreign uh, English English language newspaper in Paris after the war. I mean, there's, it's, the, the parallels are all over the place. Um, he was in love with a woman that he couldn't have. Uh, uh, Hemingway, if you look at his <laughs> marriage history and his relationship history, um, no matter who he was with, he kind of seemed to always want somebody else. And he'd move on to them, and then they wouldn't be that ideal woman, so then he'd move to the next one. So uh, Hemingway and Jake Barnes had a lot in common. Um, and one of the pivotal scenes in the sun also rises is when the whole group, these expatriates, ha ha ha, very similar to, to his life in Paris, travel to Spain to see a bullfight. And that, that marks a big change in, in perspective for Jake Barnes, as I do think also in, in his life, in Hemingway's life, that this these events that he experienced while working in Paris were pivotal and marked a big change in his life. Um, he eventually did go back to the United States, but he lived in Cuba for, for quite a while. Um, now, this was pre-Castro Cuba, although he did actually, by, by many accounts that I find verifiable and believable, he actually did meet and, and personally correspond uh, with Fidel Castro. And when I mean correspond, I mean he actually met the guy and, and to, I wouldn't say knew him, but knew was familiar with him in, in a face-to-face, person-to-person basis. Um, but he did live in Cuba for, for quite a while. Um, 
he was while he was in Cuba he his love for fishing just just eclipsed everything he became heavily heavily into into fishing and I'm talking like you know big fish not going sitting on a dock catching some brim or something like that I'm talking like the big ocean you know swordfish and stuff of that nature uh, he also did um, eventually I believe in 1928 or 29 he moved back to the United States and lived in Key West Florida and Key West is at least in the US that's kind of Key West is synonymous with um, with Hemingway you know you can go there well, I wouldn't recommend going there right now, but ha ha ha, you know what I mean. But if you do ever go visit Key West, um, one of the main attractions on, on the island is uh, the Hemingway house. And he had a very large house in Key West um, that's renowned for a couple of things. First of all, it's his house and he did a lot of his writing there. Um, you can actually uh, go to, there was a bar that he lived, he lived in a little apartment above one of the bars that's still there in Key West and he did a lot of writing there. Um, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly he did the final draft uh, revisions and all that. Yes, real authors do revisions folks. Um, he did the final draft of A Farewell to Arms in this tiny little apartment. You can actually go visit it and go upstairs from the bar and, and look at the room and whatnot. And you can also visit his house, the Hemingway house. Uh, it's a major tourist attraction there. And as I said, it's known for obviously it being the Hemingway house, but also he had an affinity for polydactyl or six-toed cats. Yeah, I know that sounds weird, but there are six-toed cats. Uh, the the legend is, who knows how much of this is true and how much is embellished, but the legend is is that someone, I, I can't, don't, I'm not even going to try to guess who, but someone had given him a gift of, <clears throat> of a cat that had six toes, and he loved the cat. And, and if you see this, basically this villa that he lived in, uh, in Key West, it's at least I I, I don't I can't say right like today right now, but I visited it uh, when I was in the Keys about ten years ago, and I went to the Hemingway house, and these cats with six toes are all over the property. I mean, there's I don't even want to try to guess. I saw at least twenty or thirty of them just running around. They're just they're just within the walls of the of the uh, of the house. Um, so that was kind of one of his strange quirks. Um, now, around this time, while he was in Key West, he, he had become, his, his reputation as an author had, had really been soaring. And sometime during all this going on, uh, he actually got into somewhat of a rivalry and you, you could again this is the stuff of legend amongst literary people but, uh, with William Faulkner and there's a lot of printed I guess you could say hearsay or evidence that the two of them really did not like each other and as as you can see from what we read with uh, Faulkner and with this story, their styles were, could not be more different. You know, Hemingway was very simple, very straightforward, whereas Faulkner is more, um, well, verbose, I would say, uh, more, more wordy. And they both had different views on each other's styles. Now I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of this, so I'm not giving direct quotes, but you can you can obviously use Google and and get the real quotes, the exact quotes. But basically, Faulkner thought that Hemingway's style was too simple. It, in other words, that it was not. He he basically was of the belief that. 
Hemingway couldn't really get a lot of deep down stuff through his style of writing because it was too simple. And there's kind of making an equation there. You know, if the writing's simple, then the thoughts behind the writing must be simple. Was was kind of what what Faulkner was saying to an extent. And there's one quote, um, one interview where he's quoted as saying something to the effect of uh, Hemingway never wrote a sentence that sent someone running to a dictionary. In other words, his words, you know, it's easy to understand, therefore it must not be that complex. Um, I completely, totally disagree with that, and who knows, Faulkner could have been being a little facetious, whereas Hemingway said almost the opposite of Faulkner, you know, he was like, say, his thoughts were basically that Faulkner used a lot of fancy prose, a lot of, you know, the stream of consciousness, a lot of weird diction, weird structure, um, to hide the fact that he wasn't really saying a lot. So, you know, like a, what we would say now is basically like a word salad or something like that. So he was using all of these big words and this weird punctuation, this or lack thereof, and the, this crazy style. But if you really look below the surface, there's not much there. And Hemingway used what, what I call the iceberg metaphor. And Hemingway basically said, you know, his writing was like an iceberg. What you see on the surface is only a tiny fraction of what lies below it. The majority of it is underneath the surface. He was using this metaphor to describe his writing, his style, saying basically, you really have to look below and between the lines to see what's really going on here. And I do agree with that with his writing. You know, I say uh, because his structure and style is simple, that does not by any stretch mean that what he's saying is simple. But at the same time, I do feel that Faulkner, through his style, was his writing is incredibly deep. You know, I don't, I don't, now, who knows how much of that was just them having a rivalry? Uh, be, and there is evidence to show that they did have a, a high amount of respect for each other, even though this public um, kind of public feud, oh, which was also um, kind of highlighted by the fact that uh, when the film version of To Have and Have Not, which is one of Hemingway's novels, was made, um, who I can't remember who the producer was, but anyway, they hired William Faulkner to write the screenplay for it to have and have not, um, which did not sit well at all with uh, <coughs> with Hemingway. You know, this guy he's got this intense rivalry with. He doesn't like his style. He's openly said that he's just he's using all this big fancy stuff to hide the lack of depth. Well, he wrote the screenplay for To Have and Have Not, um, so <clears throat> that that kind of stung. However, later in later years, when uh, Hemingway published The Old Man and the Sea, which for which he won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Now, remember, Faulkner also won the Nobel uh, Prize in Literature and two Pulitzers. Poor Hemingway only won one Pulitzer. So the, the, this rivalry is just is unmatched in literature as far as I'm concerned, and, and without question in American literature. Um, but when Hemingway did publish The Old Man and the Sea, Faulkner actually wrote a very, very uh, flattering review of it. You know, he said this is, he, he actually said this, might, this is one of the greatest works amongst all of us, including himself. Um, it was extremely high praise, but ironically, if you go and read the review, Faulkner kind of, maybe that's just how he writes, I, I, of course, but maybe also to put a little sting into the review, the review is full of these incredibly long and complex sentences. So if you can see, you know, what, what I was talking about earlier, you can see how that could possibly be a, a little, you know, kind of a fun little jab at Hemingway, but also it was extremely um, respectful and flattering. Um, it was almost, it's almost like an admiration 
so yes, they did have this intense rivalry, but I don't, me personally, I don't think they had anything uh, approaching ill will or hatred for each other, which some some people portray it as that. You know, if you read some books about the rivalry or some stories uh, about the rivalry, like oh, they hated each other, but I don't I don't think it was that far. I think they just had different opinions on what what real writing should and should not be. And, you know, that goes with anything. I mean, think about in sports, you know, think about some of the, the greatest rivalries in sports. The, a lot of these people, while they go at each other's, you know, throats on the, on the court or whatever, off the court, they usually had pretty high praise for each other. Um, so, well, I guess I'm going way old school, but I would say like one of the big rivalries I remember from when I was a little kid growing up was Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. You know, and they take jabs at each other, they throw barbs out, but it, but they had nothing but the highest of respect for each other while they were playing, and afterwards when they played together. You know, so kind of I kind of compare it to that, um, but that's basically uh, when Heming when Hemingway was at his peak. However, things started to go downhill rather, rather quickly, and there's lots of theories. You know, um, one of them was definitely alcohol. Just as with Faulkner too, uh, Hemingway was by every definition, uh, by towards the end, latter years of his life, was was without question an alcoholic, and he became increasingly paranoid. Now, the reasons behind that are widely speculated, but he had his life of adventure and and you know with the uh, the wars oh i i forgot to mention this uh, not only was he an ambulance driver who was very seriously injured in world war 1 he was also a war correspondent in world war 2 and he was actually on one of the boats during the d-day landing at normandy his boat turned around and went back to the ship because he was a reporter, a civilian, and once they got off the main in that landing craft, and they realized, no, this we got to go back, we got to take this guy back. So he literally witnessed the D-Day invasion of Normandy from one of the ships off, right off the shore of, of Normandy, Omaha, and, and uh, all those beaches. Um, so quite quite an amazing life. Um, However, through his life, uh, he also was in survived two plane crashes. Now we know, just you guys know, I'm not a math person, but we know the odds of surviving one plane crash are pretty slim, much less two. And these were not little like little crashes; these were plane crashes, y'all, and and smaller aircraft. Um, but he did suffer some some pretty uh, uh, a couple of severe head injuries or head trauma. And some people speculate that he had suffered some some sort of uh, trauma, brain trauma, that was at least partially coupled with the alcohol, were at least partially responsible for his decline. Now he ended up in uh, Ketchum, Ketchum, Idaho, on kind of a compound because his par he he had become extremely paranoid at this point. Um, he thought that the FBI was following him and monitoring him, um, which may have been true, you know, there, uh, uh, to some extent, and to a, some extent it was true, but I think he <clears throat> kind of o had overblown it. However, as his alcoholism increased and he was suffering from diabetes and, and many other things, his health was, his weight, he was getting, uh, you know, his weight was getting out of control. His health was declining, and as his mental faculties started declining, he was losing, quite rapidly, losing his ability to write. Now, he could write physically. I'm talking about the caliber. The quality was, was diminishing. And I believe that that's when he realized that he couldn't write the way he used to be able to write anymore, that for him, that was, that was the end. And he... On July 2nd, 1961, he took his favorite shotgun and 
used it to end his life on in in Idaho. Um, so a uh, pretty sad ending. Now on an interesting note, um, suicide runs. It's un uncanny the the suicide rate in his direct family. His father, who was a physician, a doctor, his father committed suicide. Um, he committed suicide. Um, his granddaughter, uh, who was a very famous model, <coughs> fashion model named Margot Hemingway, she was also an actress. Uh, Y'all might not recognize the name, but in the, in the 1980s, Margot Hemingway was a huge star and, uh, and model. And uh, she committed suicide. Um, if you look at the direct line, I believe there's somewhere like six or seven suicides in the family. So it's it's a strange phenomenon uh, and a sad one, w without question. Um, however, you know, as far as a writing career goes uh, in American literature, I, you know, him he's he's at the top, and. Don't be fooled by the simplicity of his writing style. There, like, like I totally, one hundred percent agree with the iceberg metaphor. There is a whole lot going on beneath the surface. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there for today. And in the next video, I will actually be talking about the story "Hills Like White Elephants." Now, y'all really need to read this story. You, it, it is incredibly short, and it will take you at the absolute longest 15 20 minutes tops to read so please have it read by next time and i'll be back uh either tomorrow or the next day to put up another video so until then y'all take care of yourselves stay safe and i will virtually see you soon bye